curious as Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 74. We are finalizing our countdown of the top 100 board games of all time. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me once again is Orion. Hello. And uh, this is our final one for the 2020 edition of the top 100 games. We're going to count down the final 33 games, the top third of the list. And it's going to be super exciting, I think. I'm I'm very happy. I was looking at this the other day. I was very happy with how the list turned out. I mean, I formed the list over a month ago at this point. But looking at it again, I, I like it quite a bit. Uh, if you didn't listen to our previous installments, you should. But note that... Uh, a couple things in terms of how we're going to go over this. Since we're doing a big chunk of games at a time, uh, instead of doing like 10 at a time for an hour-long podcast, we're doing 33 at a time, dividing it into thirds. So games that are have been featured a lot on this podcast that we've talked about before a lot, we might skim over. New games added to the list might be talked about more. Uh, games that moved up or down a lot will be talked about more. So we're going to emphasize the new stuff a bit more. And also note that what I did is I noted how far up or down a game has moved uh, relative to the games it was competing against on last, not last year, but the last iteration of the list from 2018. And so if I say like net movement, that means only relative to the games that uh, were on the list last time, not the games that are new, newly appearing on the list. So, yeah, there we go. Last list was a bit more contentious than most, uh, but I think there'll be more agreement on this list as we go over the very, very best games. Um, there, I think there'll be some disagreement. If these are the best games, generally we agree on a lot of things. So, Yeah, I don't think, glancing at the list, I don't think there are going to be any... No, there will be no major disagreements. There may be some minor disagreements. Uh, and I think the new games on the list you will enjoy quite a bit. Sounds good. Let's go. Cool. Let us start with number 33, brand new to the list. Another Reiner Knizia game, Modern Art. Oh, yeah. Uh, the auction game, like the prototypical auction game, because uh, it covers five different auction types or four different auction types all in the same super elegant game. Yeah, it's got once around auctions. It's got normal bidding. It's got simultaneous bid. It's got I can't remember the fourth one at this at the moment. What's the fourth one? I forget. Oh, there's the one where the person, the first person, sets the price, and then anyone else can like outbid it. Oh, uh, right. They offer it at that number and have to buy it if no one else is willing. Yeah. To pay it. It's offered at a price. Right. Right. And people are can either buy or pass. And then it goes to the, you know, the one who put it up. Uh, But the cool thing about the game, uh, if you haven't played it, is that the value of what the art you're auctioning is determined by how many pieces of art that artist has sold. So it's like a set collection thing where the value of the set is in flux based on how much people collect those sets. Right, uh, which I think is is super cool. It creates a really easy to get into game uh, that has a lot of interesting decisions. Yeah, I remember tweeting after we played this that it was the best game I'd played in a while. Yeah, so it's it was definitely a good one. Yeah, very very good. That's modern art from Reiner Knizia. I think that is the final Reiner Knizia game. Honestly, you could do a top 100 of just Reiner Knizia games. You could. I haven't played 100 Reiner Knizia games, but someday. Oh, I did just see that uh, Dan Thoreau from Space Biff just is, is doing right now, as time of recording, is doing his best of end of year list. Mm-hmm. He doesn't rank games necessarily, but he groups like the, his favorite best games and, and talks about them a bit more at the end of the year. And he spoke very, very highly of a new Reiner Knizia game, I think called Babylonia, uh, which looked kind of abstract, but uh, he was raving about it. So I haven't actually purchased a game in a while, except for an expansion. Man, I've been trying not to purchase games, but maybe I might go in for that one because 
A new very good Reiner Kenitsi game. Sounds great. Moving on to number 32, moving up 16 net spots on the list, uh, up nine total spots, just because I think it is a delightful worker placement game. That is Uwe Rosenberg's Neusfjord, uh, which is, is, is one of those games that's just so pleasant to play. It's got fun stuff. Uh, the randomization of the buildings makes each game slightly different, and uh, I love the art on it also. Yeah, I remember we were playing this game. I think we first played it at PAX and loved it, and then it was like the go-to game every week, it seemed like, or every month for a while. Um, and I think you like this game more than the rest of us, but it's definitely a good one. I think Lindsay likes it a lot also. I think me and Lindsay might be the, the two champions of this game. And I can I can totally see why some people will say, okay, it's just another worker placement game. But it, it does enough right things uh, and has enough new kind of twist to it that I, I find it very, very fun. Um, although it certainly does feel like an Uwe Rosenberg game. So, you know, it's it's along the same lines as his other worker placement games, but maybe a bit more gentle, a bit more forgiving. Uh, and it has more variation, more variability rather, uh, in its, uh, gameplay than Caverna, which is his other more gentle worker placement game, uh, that I've played, uh, that I don't like nearly as much, largely because it's, the buildings are all kind of the same each time. So there's lots of different paths you can go down, but New Stewart is, is quicker, uh, it's easier to understand and, uh, has a bit more, uh, variation in its setup. Uh, that's number 32, Neusfjord. Number 31, basically staying uh, relatively in the same spot as before, is the wonderful splatter game, Food Chain Magnate, which I just remembered, because uh, I was reminded, it has a uh, apparently a good online implementation. So maybe I'll try to get a game of that going online. It has an expansion, too, that we've never played, right? Oh, yeah, the you we 100... Have Dollar. I didn't buy it. Did you buy it? No, I thought you had You it. played it, though, right? No. I thought you played it at a, when you were out somewhere with traveling no, the world. I thought I, I thought I held the expansion, but I don't remember ever playing it. Yeah, it's very expensive. Um, I mean, as is the base game. So I didn't want to necessarily commit to it. I don't feel like I've played out the base game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it has a bunch of different modules. And it's also it's also called like the catch up expansion, which is hilarious. Yeah. But I would certainly be down for playing it. I just don't necessarily want to invest that much money in in that expansion yet. Um, although I did pre order the new printing of what's the one that's coming out? The Great Zimbabwe, uh, oh, which yeah. is a splatter I game. I I don't think has been in print for a while. And then I I asked around, and everyone was like, "Oh yeah, it's my favorite splatter game. It's the best." Or it's my second favorite splatter game. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go for that. You said you played it. I played it. It was pretty interesting. It's a good game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll be excited to play that. I don't know when it's coming out, but I think I pre I pre ordered it or like subscribed to the mailing list. I don't remember. Uh, but I'm always in for more splatter games. Moving up to number thirty, it's been on every iteration of the list. Agricola, Uwe Rosenberg's other game. News for you, it almost caught it. I didn't realize they were this close on the list. Uh, but I do prefer Agricola a little bit more just because it's so soul-crushing. And if you don't like soul-crushing games, then what are you even doing? I mean, that's a joke. You can... You can <laughs> you're allowed to have fun. You're allowed to have games. fun. <laughs> you don't have to... You don't have to crush your soul and everyone else's. You don't have to drown in existential despair when you play games. But I don't know. I find it to be a bonus. Uh, Agricola, which we have talked about quite a bit. Number 29, brand new to the list, the absolutely brilliant, I wish I had thought of it, trick-taking game, The Crew. Trick-taking, that is cooperative. Yeah, cooperative trick-taking. I think certainly our most played new game of 2020. Uh, yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. I mean, we've no gone through close to the first 40 missions, I believe. Yeah, I think we've beaten the first 40 scenarios and have replayed some of them when we swap in and out new groups of people. So. Yeah, yeah. The I mean, the major downside to the crew is introducing someone new to it, especially if they're not familiar with trick-taking. I heard some discussion 
at uh, when it was kind of the, the hot thing and people were talking about it that, oh, this would be a good introductory trick-taking game because it's cooperative. I disagree. I mean, Hearts is a fine introductory t- trick-taking game. There's not much to it. The crew, the, the problem is almost that it is cooperative because the new person, if they make mistakes, is just going to bring everyone down and then everyone else, it's going to be hard for everyone else to not communicate that, oh yeah, you're ruining us <laughs> with your bad play. Yeah, and in Hearts or Spades, you're not really supposed to table talk, but there's, it's, I don't know, in, in a competitive game... You're not letting people down. You're maybe losing to someone, which is a little different. Yeah. I don't know. I I would agree, though. I don't think... I don't know. I guess if you want to play a cooperative trick-taking game, this is great. Um, But you might be better off introducing someone with hearts or spades. Yeah. Generic trick-taking. Spades also being the other probably most played game for us in 2020. We've played a lot of spades. Yeah, Although it didn't game. make my list quite. It was actually fairly close, I think. But yeah, the crew is brilliant. I mean, what what I think is great about it is that it is a twist on trick-taking that actually highlights a lot of the best features of the genre. Keeping track of card movement, figuring out the implications of turn order, uh, all the, you know, the, how to use Trump, all this stuff is really highlighted in the crew. Uh, when it may be considered in a more advanced thing in other game, in other trick-taking games. In the crew, it's necessary. Yeah, it also inverts some of those normal tropes because a lot of the time you have to figure out how to get someone else to win certain tricks or in a certain order or one person has to win the first and the last trick or... You can't win a trick with Trump, or you have to win with the lowest number card, or different sort of these inversions that make it an interesting puzzle to solve as a group without communicating. Yeah, and it also has that cool cooperative thing that's also present in games like the Shipwreck Arcana, where not doing something can almost give as much information as doing something. For instance, in the crew, most missions you are allowed to pl- to show one of your cards from your hand face up in front of you and give a little bit of information about that card. But in some cases, it can almost be super telling when you reach a critical point and someone doesn't reveal information. And you're like, what's the implications of that for what they have in hand? That, that by re- revealing information, they think they would actually make the make it harder for us um and it has all these kinds of cool subtleties i th- i think it's, it's great it's, it's wonderful and the writing's funny you got a little snippet of a mission each time yeah i mean they give it's you fun. they give you a little story it's got fun stuff different missions uh and challenging very very challenging moving up to number 28 uh staying roughly the same relative places before suburbia a game i find completely delightful i love it um, although, uh, like New Short, I think I like it more than anyone else in our group, probably. We, we don't play it that much. I did drool over, they released the Deluxe Edition, which looks, it looks nice. It looks really, really good. But, I mean, we already have the base game, and I think all the expansions? Maybe not one of them. I don't remember. Uh, but I, I really like Suburbia. Moving on to 27, brand new to the list. A game that I think I'm quite terrible at, but I love it a lot, and that is Pipeline. It's 18 quick actions, guys. 18 quick actions. Oh, man. You can... I I, I have not wrapped my brain around this game. I cannot play well. In fact, I believe by far my highest score was my first time playing. And then like last time playing, I think I finished with negative money. Like, I think I lost money. Maybe that was two times ago. I don't remember. Your score will vary wildly based on what objectives are out. Because some scale up to, like, 400 bucks, and some only scale to, like, 100 bucks. Yeah, and it's also very much a game of exponential growth, one way or another. Like, if you get to a certain... It's all about getting to, like, a certain point in your income, 
to be able to actually do things. Like the first half of the game or third or whatever is just a grind counting every little penny uh, to be able to get to a point where you can actually accomplish things. And if you're like a turn ahead in reaching that point, you've won the game at that point, unless you make some, some grievous errors. It's very much almost like an 18xx game where the f- early decisions are, are front loaded with importance. And then like the last bit of the game is just kind of scoring that out. Like the game's already been won or lost. and There's not a lot of pivoting you can do at the end, but I mean, pipeline is deceptively quick playing as well. Uh, so it doesn't bother me that much that it's, it's front loaded like that. I just never reach that point And then I wither and die. <laughs> <laughs> I think my biggest frustration with this game is how you can get blocked out from getting any of the technologies either by turn order or or progressing in them by someone else making the obvious move to block you from getting the top one i understand why it's a thing and it's a good part of the game but i find it frustrating to not be allowed to build that part of my engine yeah it's weird because many games have these kind of technology like special powers and abilities as a feature of the game in pipeline they're almost like thrown in as a side thought because yeah you can get blocked out so easily and they can be strong they're not necessary um i was frustrated at first because i thought they were very very powerful but i did look into it a bit and the designer has a very very convincing argument that you can easily play well without gaining a technology he's done the math on that uh, by all accounts, he's just like a game genius. Uh, so has, has worked through the math there. But it does violate that kind of rule of making the fun part also beneficial. Not really. It's like you have all these cool technologies, and then like in a three-player game, one person's just kind of going to get blocked from them. So it's like, no, you can't have this fun thing. Um, and then it's like, well, you don't really need it anyways, but you're like, I want the fun thing. So there's a little bit of that, I think, of just like the game dangling this fun stuff in front of you and be like, no, it's not that important. Go away. Uh, but not enough to severely influence my opinion of it. I think it is a brilliant, brilliant game. Yeah, that said, it's a good game. I think I enjoyed it a lot more the second time I played it. The first time I was kind of just frustrated and not really knowing how to do anything and struggling through. And then the second time I felt like I actually executed a strategy and felt good at the end. Um, I also think it's a bit better at two since it can drag at higher player counts. Yeah. um, It's definitely a game that the the playtime is going to significantly decrease with experience. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Also the, the variation, the two player only variation that they named Curious Cargo just came out, uh, which Mm. I have been told by some people is even better. So I might have to get my hands on that. Plus, Pipeline has great art and production. Oh, it's the E&O tool stuff. Uh, It looks so good. Number 26, a game that took me by surprise. Wonderful, wonderful game of exploration in Wonder Space Corps, uh, which uh, we had a lot of fun with. Um, deceptively simple. It looks kind of complex at first, but the gameplay is quite straightforward. You're playing a card to get an action, uh, but the details and the sense of scale and not sci-fi, but just like near future space exploration is, is awesome. Oh yeah. The scale is the thing that really sets this game apart. Um, without that, it's, you know, a pretty well built, you know, draw cards, spend them to yeah, kind of pseudo deck Some builders, pseudo, kinda. Not well, not a little real. bit, but not really. Yeah, and you kind of you have your playboard where you build up some passive powers and you try to you know eke out some efficiency over your opponent. Um, but the scale is just the the part that just blows me away. Of you, you know, the first third of the game, you're <laughs> from the Earth to Mars. You're just trying to get to Mars and maybe land on an asteroid along the way or hit a Lagrange point. And then the second point, the second part is you're exploring the outer solar system. And then it jumps like, you know, I don't know how long in time, but it jumps in scale to solar systems. And uh, then you're colonizing these other systems and building out and 
Um, it's just the way the number scale and the space is so such a cool system and the idea of progressing through time and ah, uh, it's great. I love it. It's a game where a cynical person could look at the game and be like, okay, it's it's a bunch of numbers. It's a fine game, but. For us, and I think for people who try it with an open mind, it will capture this sense of wonder, um, and uh, that comes with with the idea of space exploration. Like, it's it really has a strong thematic pull for us, um, and I think yeah, the, I mean the idea of like exploring outside of our galaxy to different st- or to different stars is so cool and so interesting. I will say the two-player game is pretty straightforward. I don't think it's the the ideal play count. Um, we found, we played it once three-player, and there was a lot more blocking and being able to interfere with other players, which I think is more of what, like, the competitive game is about. But I, I still had a lot of fun playing two players and just kind of doing what I wanted to do. Yeah, I think the three, and I assume the four-player game there's more of a round robin sort of you have to choose a different strategy and play off of each other whereas a two-player game it's more of just you know that efficiency grind of hitting the different objectives a turn before your opponent mm-hmm. uh, but uh, i think but, an underrated game I, I don't see really any talk of this game and it, it should be it was great um, I, it. I mean part of it's a gmt game so it's gonna not be known a lot outside of uh, people at least dabble in war games since they're mostly a war game publisher. But I think if this was made by, if this was made by a more like a Euro game publisher, I think it would have gotten a lot more uh, traction and visibility. But people should check it out. Space Corps number twenty six, number twenty five. Another new game to the list. My favorite abstract game right now. Tack. Really? Uh, yeah. I am shocked that this is as high as it is. I revisited it. I played with Amber some, and oh, it, the, the the discovery process for this game is so fun, so interesting. Um, it's, I mean, I, I talked about Go on the last podcast, and certainly Go is probably a better game, a uh, deeper game, uh, more complex, more interesting, but it it's so hard to get into and understand basic strategy tack. I feel like after three or five games, you feel like you've learned a lot. At least that was my experience. I feel like I learned a lot and yet haven't really scratched the surface of what strategy can look like. Um, it's got everything you want from an abstract game in terms of the like hori- like the, the potential to anticipate your opponent's moves and calculate the best uh, possibilities is just limited by your own knowledge, experience, and, and ability. It's got all that good abstract stuff, really interesting um, ideas to it. I like that it's connected to a book I like, Wise Men's Fear. It looks nice. It, I just really am enjoying tech, and I would love to dive into it. I, I should actually bring it up with Amber again. She She enjoyed playing it with me, and I would love to have just set aside some time in the evenings and play tack with Amber. That would be fun. Did you play this one? Yeah, I played it a couple times with you. Like, when you and Matt and I were playing it, Yeah, we played a couple times around there. Um, I thought it was good, but I would not put it this high. Yeah. Um, It just really captured me. Uh, The second time I got into it, first time I got into it, wrote a good review of it, or a positive review. Whether or not the review is good is up to you all. Uh, but a positive review. But then the second time I, I went in, I'm like, oh, yes, I remember this. And uh, I, I really got excited about it. Number 24 on the list, staying in a relatively similar spot as last time, Lisboa, the next Vital Lacerda game on my list. I think I've had, what, three so far? This is the fourth? We love basically all of his games. <laughs> yeah, what did I have? I had CO2 was the low one. Did I have... Did you have Venus? You had the Gallerist, I think. CO2, definitely had the Gallerist. Yeah. And uh, Lisboa. Lisboa, okay. Um, is the next one. Uh, I will spoil not the last one on the list. We'll be talking about another one later on. Uh, this is... Probably his most complex one. I, On Mars is also quite complex, but I've only played it once. On Mars may beat it. On Mars is very complex. 
Yeah, um, I haven't played on Mars, but this felt a half step up from the Gallerist or Kanban or CO2. Yeah, um, I've got to revisit Kanban now that the new edition is out. Uh, you really liked Kanban, I know. I like uh, it more than you did. Yeah, certainly. I, mean, I um, don't. It's not my favorite of his games. Okay. But I know I, for a lot of people, it is their favorite of his games, which I find interesting. Yeah. I mean, they all a lot of his, his games are similar to each other. Lisboa, I think, has some really fun, subtle thematic integrations in all the, all the subsystems that play with each other. The best part, the highlight to me, is the section of the board where you're actually rebuilding like businesses. Yeah. It's got some fun graph stuff. Uh, and who doesn't like fun graph stuff? Yeah, as with any of his games, there's a lot of interlocking systems that you kind of have to figure out how to do enough of all of them, or which ones you're going to skimp on and cheat by on, and how to make your actions be more efficient by hitting multiple things. So. Yeah. Plus, if you're a bad person, you can con unwitting people into the game by saying, look, it's a very simple game, you just play a card. <laughs> on your turn, you play a card. That's uh, that's that the game. Is I true but very misleading. I think it's technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> also, isn't there a great story about Lisboa? The production being de- delayed because there was a fire in the warehouse. Where yes, it was? where the game and is it's about, a, it's about rebuilding rebuilding Lisboa, Lisboa after the fire and yeah, or the earthquake and the tsunami and the fire. It was like three different disasters. Yeah little irony there oh man number 23 moving up relatively 20 spots wow from last time up 17 total spots because i played it some more and i fell back in love with it much like tack terra mystica what were you doing with terra mystica last time how'd you let it slip (laughs) i don't know i think it was high on the 2016 list and then it slipped down and now it's back up i don't know i just didn't play it as much i think in the top third Top third, yeah. Top quarter. Great game. Brilliant game. I don't care that it's not particularly balanced between the factions. You can house rule that. Doesn't matter. I'm not good enough for that to really matter. Uh, I just really love playing Terra Mystica. It's fun. It's vibrant. Uh, It's got all the good crunchy mathematical planning stuff uh, with uh, the highlight of all the different fun fantasy races that have their own different strategies and powers and emphases uh, yeah, they, they feel so, love. so, so different to play, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, I actually played online a couple of weeks ago and played the Darklings, which I believe are considered the best in the base game, uh, but still lost. Still lost the game. Very sad. Number 22, a mainstay on the list, basically a state in relatively the same position as it has for a long time, War of the Rings 2nd Edition. Great, it's Lord of the Rings. Was there an expansion? Since in the last couple of years? Uh, there's an expansion I bought. I think it's been out the whole time. Okay. I think it has two or three expansions. Did we, did I we got one. Did we have we not it? yet played it. We should. Okay. I believe it's still in shrink. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even opened the box. Uh, yeah. But I got the expansion. Someone was... I got it used... Or not used. It was, or I got it secondhand. But it was never opened. And I think it's the highest rated expansion. Uh, so it'll be fun to see how that changes things up. Uh, I think it adds more elves... I don't know. I think there's an elf on the box. Okay. Maybe elf stuff. Who knows? Number 21, also new to the list. We're getting down to the bottom. Last couple new to the list items. I think there's only two more after this. But this one, boy, what a game. A wild, crazy game. Just came out with a new edition or a new new printing, I suppose. I, I don't think much changed other than the art. Thank goodness, because the art's very bad in the base game. All that to say, number 21, Sidereal Confluence. Would you like some cubes for my cubes? (laughs) The epic, epic trading game uh, that only in the world of board games, which thankfully has not become yet a super mega moneyed industry, can you have a game that plays up to nine players about trading cubes with each other and has needlessly complicated lore. (laughs) Needlessly complicated lore and alien names. 
<laughs> yeah, I completely ignored all the lore when I was playing the one time. It was just about the cubes, and I lost horribly. The alien name's so crazy and wild that they actually tell you how to pronounce them on the player sheet. Uh, one of them has like six apostrophes. Just nonsense that would be stamped out if we were in a rich industry. Keep the quirkiness alive, people. Reward this stuff. Reward the nonsense and the craziness and the individual touches. I don't, I mean, I'm glad this game did well or warranted a, a reprinting with better art because, I mean, I, I don't know how it did well. It's a crazy game. It it's is, an insane game. It takes like two a, to three hours. It's a four to nine player trading game with extremely asymmetrical players. Yeah, like you need a huge table to play this because there's yep. just cards and cubes everywhere. Yep. It's hard to get into to describe the game. It's hard to get people to understand what's good for them. All the even the easier alien races have complexities to like barriers to get in to figure out what's good. Mm -hmm. And yet it's done well enough. I, I think it's just because the trading is so strong. Like this is there's trading in a lot of games. This is the trading game. Is it, this your favorite trading game? Uh let me see. Are any games above here trading? Uh I'm gonna say no other games. Yeah. In what I would call a trading game. So there are Prim games above it. Trading game. yeah. There are games above it that include trading, but they are certainly not a trading game. This is the ultimate trading game, there as you far go. as I'm concerned. There you go. The Mark Davis Thoughtful Gamer Top Trading Game of All Time. Of All Time. Number 21, Sidereal Confluence. There we go. Number 20, here we go. The next and final Vital Lacerda game, Venus. This one has shot up the list for you over this the years. This one really shot up. I figured it out. It was that we had the Vitalis Heretic Day, and we played it, and I'm like, it, the light bulb clicked. I'm like, oh, I get this one now. And then we immediately played it a second time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've ever... Well, the number of times I've done that are very few, but... Yeah. We played a complicated game and then immediately played it again. <laughs> yeah. And as I wrote in my review, it's because I realized it is a it's a small game in a big game's body. At its heart, it is a kind of like a roll for the galaxy kind of game where you kind of pick a strategy, you commit to it, you ignore other things, and you see how it turns out. And if people know what they're doing and and it can actually not be that long of a game and can allow that. It just has all this other stuff going on uh, that makes it seem like it's a big, long game arc. The arc to the game is very brief. You build up the, the vineyard you or the winery you want to build up, and then you try to cash it out hard at the end. But it doesn't have the scope in terms of the... Uh, the rhythm of the game that another bigger game would have. Um, for instance, compared to, I don't know, compared to, let's talk, go back to like Nusjord, right? You build up, you get some, uh, you get some buildings, you get some elders, uh, and then more buildings and elders come out, or more buildings come out at least, and then you try to seize on some opportunities on that in the middle game and do some navigating. Uh, and you have a third wave of buildings that you try to score lots of points from. That's like a three to four kind of beats in that narrative of that game. Uh, in Venus, it's like build your winery, cash out. And everything else is just the details, the tactical decisions of how to do that the best. At least that's how I comprehend Venus. Uh, maybe people disagree with me or don't get where I'm getting at. But that's kind of the light bulb that went off that I'm like, oh, this is really cool. It's a great game. That was number 20, Venus. Number 19, uh, it's again a mainstay on the list. Been kind of in the same position the whole time. Seven Wonders, which even though I played like a hundred more times on Board Game Arena, still enjoy. Also, my best game on Board Game Arena. I actually dipped into the top 100 the other day before nice. quickly dipping out. <laughs> Great game. Love yeah. it. Drafting. Solid. Classic. Wonderful. Uh, and also, the strategy guide I wrote, which is now semi-obsolete because they released a new edition and made some balance tweaks to it, is 
my highest performing article on the search engines. So there we go. Maybe you should write more strategy articles, Mark. That's actually, I, I plan to. I plan to. The problem is I don't want to write, I only write, I want to write strategy articles when I actually am confident that I'm good at the game, which is very few games. <laughs> yeah, you, we play a lot of games, but I don't know that we master all that many. Yeah, and I could, like, write basic strategy stuff, but I'll leave that for, I, I don't feel good writing, like, stuff you figure out after two or three plays. I could do a lot of strategy articles like that, but I'm not going to, that, nah, that rubs me the wrong way. Um, if I'm going to write a strategy article, it's going to dive in. It's going to dive in, do the, some of the math. Number 18, up a net 31 spots, up 29 total spots. I don't know how is it Is this was, the high riser? This is tied for the highest riser. So we talked about the highest one, also moved up 31 net spots, was London. Okay. And Three Kingdoms, all tied exactly the same amount of movement up. Three Kingdoms Redux in uh, our first... Ad- portion of the podcast if you hear that squeaky noise that's my new tiny kitten i got for christmas who is the most talkative cat i've ever witnessed in my life he does not shut up but we love him uh anyways so three kingdoms redux london and this game all moved up 31 net spots number 18 fire in the lake i don't know why it wasn't this high before i don't know what i was doing in 2018 it might have been during that period where we were overwhelmed by it but uh it is by far my favorite coin game i love it i like it a lot and think it's great i don't know if i would put it massively ahead of some of the other ones Um, i mean it's not massively ahead but i think it is my clear favorite okay i won't say by far i'll say it is clearly my favorite game i think it has kind of the best combination of gameplay mechanisms it's got in terms of mechanisms, very similar to A Distant Plane. It's kind of uh, the sequel to that one, right? So if you have, like, the first one, Indian Abyss, uh, its sequel to, so to speak, mechanically is Cuba Libre, which is basically the same game with some different flavor. Then 3 and 4, Distant Plane and Fire in the Lake, mechanically very similar with, you know, different flavor. Uh, and then each game after that is kind of, like, done more of its own thing. Hmm, okay. Right, because Falling Sky has uh, is is different than all the other ones. Pendragon has that whole battle system that uh, the, the never appeared system. before. Yeah. Liberty of Death has like the French that don't appear until a third of the way through the game, and all kinds of and stuff. The ships they the, get a lot yeah, more zany after that. Yeah, uh, in fun, interesting ways, I think. But Fire in the Lake, I think, is most similar to a distant plane, and I think, in mechanically speaking, ignoring like the fun aspect of having quirks and differences in thematic stuff i think my best like pure mechanical coin system is those two games i think fire in the lake is also the most frenemy relationship you get between all four factions um yeah some of the other ones it's a 2v2 and then some of them it's more of a free-for-all this is you have to work together but you also hate each other yeah, it has absolutely the best interfaction dynamics. Amber and I will never, ever play <laughs> the U.S. and South Vietnam uh, together again, because that was bad. Uh, <laughs> that did not work at all. Is that like one of the very few times you guys have gotten close to actually fighting about a game? <laughs> that is, uh, I think so. I mean, it wasn't really that close. But we were very frustrated with each other. Yeah. Well, and I think specifically that relationship between those two factions is my favorite faction relationship of any game. Yeah. No, any it's, game it's good. ever. That's good. It's so good. <laughs> it is so good. Uh, but it's a bit of a beast. It's uh, in some ways longer than some of the other uh, coin games. Um, not the not the simplest. Uh, so while it was the first one. Uh, that we got because it's i think it's widely considered to be the best one i don't think i really understood coin or got the appeal until we got falling sky right we we kind of learned coin with falling sky went back and played fire in the lake and liked it and then we played through all of the coin games what was that last year for a while yeah we got up through liberty or death uh yeah liberty or before death. the pandemic hit 
Um, well, before I went to travel. For that's right. You went months. out to Europe and then, uh, and then, COVID, then the, yeah. the pandemic hit. So uh, a couple have been released since then. I know Gandhi, Gandhi came, came out, out this year. And Was then there another one? there's one on P500 right now. It's the sci-fi feature one. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which uh, should be cool. I'm excited to play that. So hopefully we'll get back into 2021. We can resume our coin playthrough. <laughs> hopefully. Number 17. A mainstay on the list, my favorite party game of all time, Codenames. What more is there to say? Codenames is brilliant. It's wonderful. Yep. Vlad is a genius. It's the, best. the best. Number 16. The second to last new game on the list. Wow. My favorite 18xx game as of now, 1862. Nice. Which for 18xx players probably tells them a lot about me. <laughs> Yeah, this, and my preferences. Within 18xx, this one has, like, all of the weird stuff. Like, there's different kinds of trains. There's different... You have to get a permit to run the different kinds of trains. There's multiple ways of forming companies, and you can merge them. You You get quad jumps. You get the different bankruptcy laws, and you have this refinance thing where you can't... You, Basically, split the shares and get your initial capitalization in capital infusion. And you, you can both, there's both full and partial capitalization. Yeah, right, full and partial. The companies aren't, they're available in phased They're releases. all auctioned. Everything's, Everything's an auction. Everything's an auction. Uh, uh, every space has either a town or city on it. Yeah, every, yeah, 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 yeah. The board's this claustrophobic mess. Yeah, it's um, um I think because I played it was like the third 18xx game I played I think after I think I played 46 then 49 and then this one okay. I didn't realize how weird this one was. <laughs> but now I'm seeing that yeah, a lot of most 18xx games are just like small variations on 1830. Yep. This one's weird, but it hits stuff that I love. I love auctions. Um, and this has lots of auctions. So does 1822, all the 1822 games. Uh, cause I talked about 1822 CA, I think last time it's got a lot of auctions. It's got, it's got narrative in terms of running a company. Like I appreciate the deep strategy that goes into 1830 style games where you sometimes just want to use companies as these like, tools and you'd run them to the ground and you use them to finance other things all the financial shenanigans i understand and appreciate it that doesn't make me feel like i'm an train investor right because that that's just that's too far that's just too far into game rule it's like it's like it, it's so gamey that it takes me out of the theme of the game 1862 has lots of clever fun stuff you can do, but it all makes sense to me. It's like, of course, different types of routes and trains would run differently. I'll learn those rules. Uh, of course, you can merge companies. That seems like a logical thing to do. Yeah, there's some weird permitting rules. Governments are dumb. They have these permits. You have to have a special contract to get into London, because, again, governments. All of the crazy stuff that people think is is, like, hard and complex about 1862 makes thematic sense to me. <laughs> Whereas some of the strategic nonsense and tomfoolery that goes on in a more standard 1830 style game is harder for me to understand because it doesn't make thematic sense to me. But you don't think about like playing the shell game and moving companies around and screwing over your investors and doing all that sort of stuff. You 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 are much more interested in building a company and running it and making money. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, when I say this is, this will among 18 XX people will highlight the kind of player I am. I tend to like more operational games. I'm growing to appreciate now that we've been playing online, the more financial stuff and how to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the considerations that go in. And I appreciate it much like I appreciate like, uh, people who are very good at chess. Uh, but, in terms of something I want to sit down and spend five hours doing, I, I go with the crazy Euro game. <laughs> the 18xx that's kind of like a Euro game. It makes me, I mean, it's it's certainly not the main, like the, the mainline opinion of 18xx players, but I'm fine with that. No, I really like this one. Oh, yeah. 
I really like this one. I just push back on the idea of saying the financial shenanigans was not thematic to the early railroad expansion because I think it absolutely was. I don't know the history that well. Well, um, if you read the lore for this game, they talk about this insane period in England where literally anyone could start a railroad and just hundreds and maybe thousands of railroads got started all over the place and most of them never laid track, never ran a train, completely failed. And then they started, the government was like, oh, we need some regulations on this whole railroad shenanigans and they kind of enforced some rules on it. Yeah, I'm not saying that financial nonsense isn't doesn't happen in real life. There's just a lot of gamey aspects to the 1830 style games, like having to own a train. Okay, if you're really making a shell company, why would you need to own a train? Like, I don't know. It, I understand the pushback. Uh, it's just something in my brain. Uh, that I'm trying to settle out. And maybe two years from now when I make the next list, I'll be more into financial to 18 excesses. I completely welcome that. I think these games are super interesting. And I'll go wherever my mind and emotions take me in terms of exploring them. I've got to work up to 1817. That one may... The idea of short selling may that's get me into it. <laughs> I really want to introduce you guys to that one. But that's one of those like step up in complexity with a bunch yeah, of extra yeah. rules. Because there's different size companies and you merge them and there's all these different rules for acquisition and merging and selling and shorting and bank loans. And so, yeah. Maybe. Th See, that sounds super fun. It is super fun. That one sounds really cool. It doesn't sound. Here's what it is. Maybe deep down in my emotions, I feel like with the 1830 style game. So the games are very similar to that, that I kind of miss the boat on like learning that with everyone. So I've come in and there's like these established norms and ideas and strategies that work. And I feel like I'm just playing catch up, trying to get to like the base level of understanding of like, like strategic understanding. Like, I feel like I'm just like behind and everyone else is like, has these assumptions that I haven't yet discovered or figured out or understand on a deep level. So I think once I get to that level where I feel like I have some competence um, in understanding the strategic uh, stuff that's going on. I think I'll enjoy those games more. Uh, but give me more weird complexity that throws, that has the potential of like throwing off the experts in the more basic games. And yeah, that sounds more fun uh, that I can find my way around that. Anyways, 1862 is a glorious mess and I love it. Number 16. Number 15, uh, not a mess, a beautiful, elegant game. <laughs> beautiful, elegant game, uh, basically in the same spot as before Concordia. Who doesn't want to trade commodities in the, in the early in Mediterranean? The, the Mediterranean, <laughs> yeah, trade in the, in trading in the Mediterranean. Uh, is this my favorite trading in the Mediterranean game? It is indeed my favorite trading in the Mediterranean okay, game. Okay, what was the competition? Uh... <laughs> What other trading in the Mediterranean <laughs> games do I have on here? So that's trading in Germany. That's trading in the Nordic. Uh, okay, maybe I don't have many trading in the Mediterranean <laughs> games <laughs> on my list. But I played a few, I guess. That was my favorite. Yeah, I don't see many others. But Concordia is brilliant. Just a brilliant design. Yep, it's great. Number 14, basically staying in the same place it was before. Here I stand. Epic the, game. I don't I've played in a while. It's but. this is like perpetually on the big game list for me oh, yeah. and it just it it rarely happens and when it does it's glorious. Yeah. Talk about stories. Stories front to back of that game. I absolutely love it. What an experience. Number 13, we get finally to the highest ranking new to the list game. Brass this Lancashire. New. new to the list. New to the list. Wow. Number 13, Brass Lancashire. What was this? Like fall 2018 then? Must have been. It must have been. I'm not sure. Uh, you probably barely missed the last one, yeah. Okay. Uh, brass is so, so good. Some of the best market dynamics I've ever seen in a game. Like people talk about Power Grid as like the best market system, but Brass expands on that. Um, and it has... In my mind, the best market system that I've seen in a game. It's, oh, it's so, so good. I love Brass. It's brilliant. 
Yeah. I feel like we've talked about it, but maybe we haven't. But I don't know if yeah. we've talked about it on the podcast. Uh, I, I've mentioned it f- for sure. No, I, 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 I do want to write more about this game. I love this game. Um, it's like always, a, always a good time. Definitely a heavy game. I haven't. Tr- have I tried it two players? I don't think I've tried it two players. I've always played it, it three or four. I don't think it's considered good at two, is it? I think the I think it doesn't work as two. There's like a fan variant or something. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think I'd want to play a two player. No, it's it's just brilliant at four, um, and so so good. Yeah, it actually, I mean, it has some similarities to like an eighteen XX game in terms of. Uh, route connection and blocking people and manipulating prices of things. And... Tokening out cities, yeah. sort of. <laughs> oh, that just popped in my head. But, I mean, Brass has been around for a while. Yeah, a little bit. It's certainly not a new game overall, just new to us uh, in the past two years. And I absolutely fell in love with it. It absolutely deserves the reputation that it has as oh, yeah. a great Euro game. So number 12. Uh, mainstay on the list, lots of these classic games that I kind of learned early on in my dive into the hobby that have stuck around as great, brilliant, great games. Castles of Burgundy is number 12. This is probably your other best strategy guide, top performing article. Yeah, it's done well. And I think I think I put some stuff in that, that strategy article that I don't think I've seen elsewhere. Because I, I perused, I've perused the strategy discussions on... Uh, board game geek, but I did some math in that one, but I haven't seen written out at least. You've also played that game three hundred times, five hundred times online. Oh yeah, like five hundred times. Uh, so I I finished it, and though I, I still love it, I'd I'd gladly play it again in person. Uh, but done with the perpetual uh, twenty games of Castles of Burgundy going on. Although it does, it is one of the best asynchronous play games. Because it's not particularly strategic, it's mostly tactical. Um, it's very easy to read the board state and just choose a tile, or choose choose your actions, choose what to do. Number eleven, barely squeaking out of the top ten, which makes me sad. Why did why did this not make the top ten? I don't know. We'll have to figure out what rose up. I think I do remember what rose up, and it's worthy. Anyways, number eleven, Space Alert, the best real time game of all time. Yep. For sure. The best real-time space-based cooperative game of all time. You just made it more specific and therefore less impressive of a claim. But more descriptive. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) More descriptive, less impressive. We talk about Space Alert all the time. We love it. Oh, it's so fun. Is this the the top Flotta game? No. No? Oh, you know what the top Flotta game is. Of course, it's fine. You know what the top Flotta game is. Number 10, same spot as it was last time, sitting, chilling at number 10, Dominion. Still brilliant. Still great. It's and a classic. the new expansions are real good. Yep. I think Adventures is close to and maybe my favorite expansion for really? Dominion. It's okay. it's certainly top two or three. And good, uh, good Nocturne on. was cool. I liked Nocturne. I think there was one after that. I don't remember it very well, but good online implementation. Yeah, yeah, it's solid. Dominion is oh, it's so good. Thank you, Donald X. Number nine, another Vlada game, but not the highest Vlada game. I can't believe I forgot this one. I thought of the other one. Rising into the top ten because I played it a few more times, especially the new version of it. Uh, it was at number twelve last time. Through the ages. Yep. So good. I think the changes they made for the new edition of it are perfect. I like that military is less severe, which fits with my preferences. I didn't like how mean the original game could be. Uh, and I think toning down the military a bit gives it gives it uh, more more reliable or more at least from my perspective more balanced options in terms of different paths you can take. Like if you forego military entirely, you're still going to get crushed, but uh, it's not especially at two players not this mad rush for military power uh, that the base the the original version of the game could often be. The best abstract civilization game without a board. There you go. And also the best civilization (laughs) game. Also just the best civilization (laughs) game. (laughs) But not the best, not the highest Vlada game on my list. Yep. Uh, Vlad has done well for himself. Uh, Also, I would say best app implementation that I have played on the list. Yeah. The Through the Ages app is very, very, very good. 
and the AI is not terrible. It's it's pretty solid. Uh, I keep losing to it on medium. It's uh, I've definitely lost to it. I started doing some of the challenges and lost a bunch on those. Yeah, the challenges so. are are legit. They're hard. I mean, I think I'm decent at the game. I don't think I'm good, but man, the, some of those challenges are hard. <laughs> Number eight, moving down one spot, the resistance. Again, been on the list forever. We talked about it so much. The best social deduction game. The best social deduction game of all time, for sure. Uh, and I guess the best party game if we count it as a party game. But I'm going to give that one to, to Codenames. Uh, I don't count feels, it. It feels different. It's not a party game to us. No, we, we play it seriously. Uh, I think we're one step away from playing in an abandoned warehouse with a single light bulb <laughs> hanging from a wire. I am uh, I am a fan of trying to figure out the single light bulb hanging from a hanging by its own wires. That that's the mood that needs to happen. Uh, some people like to have light when they're playing the resistance so they can see people. Whatever. Number seven. The best. What's the what's the term? It's not a LCG? CCG LCG of all time. Android Netrunner, rest in peace. Oh, so good. I I got it. We gotta we gotta start doing some Netrunner stuff again. There's yeah, so many I different should, games we gotta. Just I should get play back again. into Genteki.net and drafting online and I stuff. Yeah, JNet's still around, probably. But yeah, uh, it just kind of like killed my enthusiasm when they killed the game. It just was hard to want to keep playing because. Even though nothing changed about the game, it's still amazing, but it was just like this smack to morale of like... Yeah. yeah. And then the game they uh, replaced it with, Star Wars Destiny, uh, they just killed. I saw on Twitter, yeah. like, right before recording this. Uh, no more support. Uh, and I bet Keyforge won't be far behind. Keyforge, notably not on my list. Not nearly as good as Netrunner. Shots fired. Keyforge, extremely mediocre game. Number six, we finally get to the highest. Yeah, the highest Vlada game on the list. Down one again, Mage Knight. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. No, it's great. Uh, <laughs> we haven't played this game in a long time. That's a, um, at this okay, point. Yeah. That is at this point. That is a very deep cut. That's like a three-year-old reference for this podcast. Oh, yeah. Actually, I just realized the like, timeline on this. There's probably like three people in the world that know that <laughs> reference other than us. Right. That was like our third or fourth episode. <laughs> this is our 74th episode. Yeah. Not even counting some of the off-week off, off week ones I didn't number. Right. Um, yeah. How would you describe this game? Categorize it. It is a slow-motion deck builder. A slow motion deck builder. It's a deck builder in slow motion. Okay. It is a deck builder. You're, yeah. You're, you have it a is. set of cards. You draw some. You play some. You get more cards. It's just you're going to get like 10 to 15 cards over the course of four hours. <laughs> and you're going to work really hard to get those cards. You're work really hard. <laughs> and then you're going to lose And then the at end. some point, like like 10 of your 20, 25 card deck is going to be useless wooden cards and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then you're gonna fight, like, eight dragons and die. <laughs> but, oh, the stories it tells, no. building up your, your Love it. mage Great knight, game. fighting epic dragons and stuff at the end, uh, crazy final battles, such a good game, such a good game. Oh, and if you get this, get the... Oh, gosh, what's the name of the expansion? Uh, yeah, the, the one that everyone likes a lot. <laughs> I don't remember the name. Get the big expansion, um, the first big expansion. It was the first expansion, Get the yeah. first big expansion and play the scenario in there. Um, that's the best way. It's the best scenario, although I would like to explore the second expansion, which was designed by Paul Grogan, who does the Gaming Rules uh, YouTube channel, podcast, does rulebook editing. He got into to all of that via helping out CGE and specifically doing Mage Knight stuff, including designing that right. second expansion, which I've heard is very good. It just doesn't like give you the best scenario that the first one does that makes it feel kind of automatic. Uh, okay. But I would love to pick up that expansion. I think at the time there was like a production issue with the printing oh, there in the was. first run yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of a reason that we delayed getting it. Although at this point now, by the Ultimate Edition, which has everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They released that. So that's the way to go if you're getting into Mage Knight. Still brilliant. I think there's probably a good um, broken token for this too, right? Yeah, I did think we get the broken we token? Did. We did, we did. It is quite good. Yes. Yep. 
Good it, insert. It's, it's a game worth getting the <laughs> getting an insert, getting the insert for. Yeah. for. <laughs> Number five, moving up four spaces, which is a lot once we've reached the top. 10. Yeah. Uh, but moving up because I played it more and I fell even more in love with it. Dominant Species. Mm-hmm. Such a brilliant game. Rip Chad. Yeah. The designer sadly passed away, who also designed uh, Combat Commander, which, uh, if we played it more, probably entered the top 100. It seemed very, very cool. And welcome to Gainesville or. Welcome to Centerville. Centerville. Did he design that one? He designed a few other games too. Uh, Dominant Species however is a masterpiece it's Absolute so good masterpiece of game design uh by far to me the best area control game uh or area majority game we'll say as a specific genre i mean we played this just a couple months ago and and introduced uh, a couple new people to it it's still amazingly elegant for a such a heavy game a long involved game lots of uh, thinking involved, but the rules are fairly easy to understand. Um, it's just what to do with those rules and those mechanisms. That's the hard part. Yep. Plus, as cones, it's all about the. It's cones. all about the cones. Number four, the epic game of space exploration, diplomacy, combat, Twilight Imperium. I'll say fourth edition. I think fourth edition is best. Fourth edition is clearly better than third edition. I think um, there's there's a couple things I like better in third edition, but overall fourth edition is a better game. Yeah, a lot of the especially even just like the basic UI improvements um, yeah. to make it's, the game easier to understand. In some ways, it's kind of like through the ages to the new through the ages. Like they just sanded off a lot of the rough edges and fixed kind of the worst mo- or not worst but most awkward parts. Yeah, of it. yeah, precisely, precisely, um, and just like reordered some things so that it makes more sense just Mm -hmm. a lot of things like that and i think did they trim down the alien list and then they are expanding it again no i believe it has all of the original plus expansion aliens it trimmed some other a lot of other stuff that was in the expansions other modules and stuff yeah Great and, game. And the expansion for fourth edition just came out. Just came out, and sadly, as I, soon as, know, as as soon as we're allowed to have six people together. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I can feasibly have a game together, I'm ordering that expansion so we can play with it. Yeah. The only reason I haven't ordered it is just because there's no game on the horizon that I can see yeah. uh, of us playing it in person. But uh it's it's definitely going in the shopping cart once that happens. Number three, the other Twilight, Twilight Struggle, which was once number one on my list, yeah, but has since been barely supplanted. I mean, it's still what can you say? It's Twilight Struggle. It's Brilliant. it's it is what it is. If if you don't know about it, you should look into it. Uh, don't be intimidated by it. It's actually of these top seven games. It's probably actually the simplest. I mean, the resist of the top ten, the Resistance and Dominion are the, easily the simplest. Third simplest is probably Twilight Struggle. So don't be intimidated by it being a GMT game or it looking kind of intimidating. Easy to get into uh, for a war war game style game and uh, and the one best of the best of games that of all time. Category. Yeah. yeah, I was watching a bunch of streams of these, uh, like the international tournament of these of, of Twilight Struggle and. They had some of the other top players commentating and analyzing the different moves and trying to predict, and that was really cool to watch. Um, oh, man. I so. forgot about that. I had to go back and watch those videos. That'd yeah. be really cool. Yeah. And actually, I mean, uh, uh, as of a couple of years ago, I think a new, entirely new strategy emerged from China. Uh, so there's a, I, I think there's a pretty hardcore group of Chinese players who play online a lot, mm-hmm. and they developed this new strategy that really focuses – that changes based on a changed calculation of the value of an influence point versus a victory point. Yeah, they value um, incremental victory points and the space yeah. race a lot higher mm-hmm. over the trying the to positional fight for the positional advantage. influence yeah. battle. And from what I understand, did very well online yeah. in tournaments and such with that. Did very well, although not although you still competitive. It's not like an overwhelming strategy. It's just. Uh, in reading some of the, I, I remember when I first heard about this, I went into the strategy forums on BGG and read uh, one of those Chinese players post a big old long explanation and discussion about how to do things. And it's not like they found some like foo strategy of like, 
here's something you can repeat over and over again and win. You know, just choose victory points every time. The details of it are extraordinarily <laughs> complex in how to implement this strategy, even though it can be explained in terms of just a slight shift in priority. Mm-hmm. Uh, you really still have to understand the cards, understand the, the odds, understand so many fine-tuned minutia uh, about the game to execute the strategy or you're just going to get squashed. Plus, it's I mean, it's scary to play that game and then consciously kind of forego the positional advantage. That's got to be terrifying to actually implement. Because if you don't succeed, like, you have, you just fail immediately at the end. Yeah, I just, I remember watching and that Sanct, the Chinese player, or I think the most famous Chinese player, I was watching a bunch of his games and he would consistently be ahead on victory points and have a dominating board position. And I do not understand how he did it. I mean, that's insane. He's just one of the best players sure, ever. Yeah, so. yeah. But yeah, it's um, Hard Struggle's brilliant. You should play it if you're at all interested in two yeah. player card driven war games. Or even interested in like the important games of our hobby. Yeah. At this point, it's it's that kind of classic level. You know, you got to watch Citizen Kane if you're into movies. If you're into board games on that level, you should probably play Twilight Struggle. Yeah. Or if you like the Cold War and want to feel the angst of yeah. decision making in the Cold War. And, or play perhaps the most thematic game ever made, as I've called it before. Number two, moving down a spot. This was number one last year, but it has dropped just a hair, not, not to knock it in any way, because it's still amazing. Gloomhaven. Brilliant. So good. I uh, think we finally finished the campaign. We finished the main campaign. We're starting to do... Oh, I, I opened, opened the expansion. The expansion we haven't yet played one of the scenarios. Yeah, we opened We ran the out of time. And yeah. then Frosthaven is on the way. Frosthaven... Uh, Jaws of the Lion came out, which is the cheaper, smaller version of Gloomhaven, which I think is great. Uh, especially since it's doing a booklet. For the map, like it's just a spiral okay. bound book nice. for the maps uh, instead of uh, the cardboard pieces you have to find and connect together. I'll take that 10 out of 10 times. I don't think that changes the immersion at all. In fact, I think that's really cool. The idea of like you're going through a storybook uh, and the pages are literally what you play on. I think that needs to be implemented more. Uh, Ryan Lockett did it. First, from what I understand, I mean, maybe some other games, that the first time I saw it was with Near and Far. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that was great. From Probably the best part of Near and Far. I mean, yeah, one of the best parts for sure uh, is the way that map uh, progressed. So I'm glad they did it with Jaws of the Lion. I assume Frost, I mean, Frost was just going to be a lot more Gloomhaven. So, which is both positive and a negative thing. I would like to see. I, more I, of the second like best see, game of all time is a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> I kind of want to see. Isaac Childress, what he does next that is truly, like, that isn't just, like, cashing in on the success of Gloomhaven, which I don't I don't fault him for at all. Like, if I made Gloomhaven and I knew that I could pump out, like, another Gloomhaven and rake in that much money, I'd do it in a heartbeat also. But I want to see, I'm curious what he's been working on, like, on the back burner. Like, what's on his list of ideas that he just, once he finds some time and tries to get it out. I want to sure. see that game. Yeah. But Gloomhaven, uh, it, it's so fun. So very, very fun. But reaching number one, up three spaces, further justified since I made the list by getting the newest expansion, playing some of that content, and it is a brilliant, brilliant expansion. Number one, Spirit Island. What a game. What a game. And man, the Jagged Earth stuff is so fun. The new spirits there are so cool. I You might argue that the desi- spirit design in Jagged Earth is better than the spirit design in the base game. If you're looking at it from purely, like, it, it's clearly, it, it would not have worked in the base game oh, in yeah. terms of an introduction. It's clearly an iteration. Because they're more complex. Because it took this game that is great and all the mechanisms that we understand and the parts of that game that we know now from playing it a bunch and yeah. you know, for years, and then makes all these new interesting ways of interacting. Yeah. I mean, in terms of an iterative expansion of just, like, more variations on the same stuff, it's the best expansion I've ever seen. On top of an already brilliant game. The, the story and narrative that it tells... Uh, every time you feel yourself growing in power throughout a single game, um, all the cool, exciting 
interactions. Like I still feel like I'm learning new, interesting stuff uh, when I play, like new strategies, new understanding of how to balance things. Every time I pick up a new spirit or one I haven't played in a while, it's this new discovery process of, ooh, what kind of goodies, what kind of fun stuff can I lean into with this spirit uh, to, to really take advantage of their strengths? Um, what kind of new powers am I going to discover in that giant power deck uh, when I gain new powers? And, oh, I can't say enough good things about Spirit Island. Truly an extraordinary game. I think well-deserving to be called the number one game of all time. Would you consider it as your number one game if you were making a list? Probably. Yeah. Probably. Um, I think, let's see, my top five would might be the same. I think my top four would be the same. Dominant Species would almost certainly be in my top ten. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with anything in the top um i'm looking for one that i top 20 <laughs> maybe sidereal confluence i wouldn't put as high because i don't love trading as much as you do mm -hmm. i don't love castle of burgundy as much as you do i'm concordia is brilliant and elegant but i don't know if it's my favorite game like you know top that level but i don't know all these games are amazing and i love them and would be at or near the top of my list if i were to make one yeah, there we go. We ended on unity and agreement. There you go. Which isn't surprising. I mean, we've been playing together a lot. We end up falling. Uh, yeah. If our opinions diverge that much, I, th I don't think we'd play as many games together as we do. Also, we tend to not play the games that we disagree on a bunch. That's true. Yeah. Because one of us is not having fun at that point. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Uh, so that wraps up the top 100. I did some other calculations and data gathering from the list. So in terms of the best years for board games, I have long maintained uh, that 2012 was a great year for board gaming. And then recently 2017, I thought was a ph phenomenal year. And that has borne out on the list. So uh, 2017 is the most games on the list, with 13 of the top 100 being from 2017. That's the year that had Gloomhaven and Spirit Island, right? So yeah, check it. Check out the games from 2017. We've got, yeah, Spirit Island, Gloomhaven, so numbers 1 and 2. Then we skip down to Venus, or excuse me. Sidereal? Sidereal, Sidereal Confluence. At 21, we've got Lisboa, Tack, Noosefjord, going back to the last podcast, Pulsar. Catch the Moon, so many great 2017 games, including the top two, uh, which is wild. Second most most seen year is 2015, although the average placement for the 2015 games is lower. 2012, the other year I highlight, uh, has nine games on the list, tied with 2019, 2018, 2016, and pre-last millennium. Uh, which I grouped together, but has a much higher average. So averaged uh, on on the top half of the list, whereas 2015 averages on the bottom half of the list. In these other years, like the 2019, 18, 16, all average well on the bottom half of the list. The years that averaged on the top half uh, would be 2017, 2013, 12, 11, and then a couple of these just have a couple or like one entry. Uh, like 2006 has, what, Twilight Struggle? Was it, what is 2006? No, Here I Stand. But that's the only game from 2006, so that one doesn't really count. Anyways, that's how it, that's how it shook out. I mean, I would like to have a more equitable distribution of the years, but I'm obviously going to be get playing more games that are more recent. Uh, but over time, I, I'm curious to see how that pans out as I get more games played from different eras of, of modern board gaming hobby, play some older classics. Uh, and see where those fall on the list. There are also just a lot more games being published now than 15 years ago. Yeah, and and I'm going to be playing a lot more of them. Yeah, there's just more around. In terms of designers, the top three most popular designers on my list, obviously, number one, Vlada. Of course. With six games on my top 100, of course. He's the man. Vital Lacerda with four games on the list, as we talked about, was a CO2. Gallerist, Venus, Gallerist, and, Lisboa. Venus and Lisboa. On Mars will probably be there next time. On Mars was on the border, but after one play, I wasn't confident enough with it. It could fall, actually. On Mars was was weird. I don't know what I'm going to think about of that if I uh, if I play more. 
Uh, but Reiner Knizia also had four games on the list. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that may increase in time as I dive more into Reiner Knizia games. Like, for instance, I would love to play Tigris and Euphrates or the new the new variant, uh, Yellow and Yangtze, 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 whatever the other two rivers are. I suspect I would like that game a lot, for instance, or maybe some of his other auction games like, um, like Raw or what's the other one? High Society. I played Raw. It was fine. Like, not bad, but yeah. not great. Yeah. Uh, in terms of publishers, uh, GMT far leads the list with 14 games on the top 100. Second place goes to CGE, largely due to uh, Vlada, uh, with seven games on the list. And then Eagle Griffin, largely due to Vital, uh, with five games on the list. So those are my top three publishers right now. That doesn't surprise me one bit. Very clearly, GMT has been my favorite publisher. In fact, of the what do I got? Three, four, five, six board game shelves. A full three quarters of one of them is GMT games. Maybe two thirds. Because I mean, looking at the shelf, it's half right now. But there's some GMT games lying around on the floor that I got to fit into the shelf somewhere <laughs> uh, for my GMT shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I love GMT as a publisher, uh, and I love the games they produce. So that rounds it out. That's some of the highlights from uh, the list, and that's the final installment. Um, these are brilliant, great games. Most of them, especially I think on this list, I have written reviews for. So if you go to the thoughtfulgamer.com, look up the game, you'll s- probably will find a review for the game. I'd say easily over half of them I've probably written a review for. And the ones that you haven't are probably showed up in a um, con review or something. Yeah, in a, in a con review or another podcast or something like that. That we've we've talked about pretty much all of these, especially any of the, any of the games that have been on the list that aren't new to the list. Have you know we've liked them for at least two years, so they've probably we've probably talked about them. Last podcast of twenty twenty. Yeah, it's going to be the new year. We just sit here a couple recording days. this on what the twenty ninth. Twenty ninth. So, yeah, hopefully here's to 2021 being a more calm year Yeah, than 2020. Uh, any final thoughts, Orion? Play more board games. <laughs> Play more board games. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another podcast. Uh, don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com, as I said before, to look up reviews and more discussion about many of these games. Uh, you can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Uh, pretty easy to find if you just look it up or go to the thoughtfulgamer.com. If you want to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer, uh, where you can get access to our live recordings of our podcast, see the brand new little kitten that i got for christmas who is super squeaky and cute that kind of content is not being uh, put on the regular podcast because you cannot see podcasts uh, by their very nature that would indeed be a vodcast as the kids are saying would it be perhaps a vlog no because i wouldn't say this is a blog this is a production more than like a vlog is more like rambly thoughts right it can be and isn't blog itself like vlogs a portmanteau of video blog right blog is web log i think and blog originally. is web log so but that i mean that's going back like 20 years or something <laughs> i'm just saying that is multiple portmanteaus towels I, what is the plural of portmanteau like stacked on top of each other that's wild sure. i just i just realized that Anyways, I wouldn't call is, it that. Is vodcast better? <laughs> I think vodcast is better. <laughs> is that any less of a portmanteau, though? <laughs> well, no, I'm not against portmanteaus. I'm just saying... The evolution. Okay. Uh, stacking them on top of each okay. other and layering them like that is uh, is interesting. Anyways, you can watch us on video uh, if you are part of the Patreon group supporting us and uh, see the little kit. Uh, he is adorable and very talkative. Mouse cat. Yes, mouse cat. The mousy little cat. Uh, Thank you for listening, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Goodbye.